Uh, we're going to be in Isaiah 6, but let me pray with you first. Lord, I thank you so much for this beautiful church. And Lord, just the work that you're doing in us and, and through us, Lord, that's our prayer that there would even more, there would be even be more of that, a deeper work in us and through us. Lord, I pray that as we study your word together, that you would speak to our hearts and Lord, that you would speak to our minds and that Lord, you would bring lasting change and salvation and sanctification and just be glorified, Lord. I pray for Justin and Andrew and all those that will be traveling. Lord, keep them safe and let it be a wonderful time together. Keep them uh, safe as they journey back and just continue this work here. And so we love you. We thank you. We pray you just open our eyes that we may see wondrous things from your law, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm here with my lovely wife, Shelly, and my daughter came for the first time, and so it's really cool. So I'm blessed. Um, yeah, if you have your Bible, let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. And while you're going there, I'm just curious, is there any, any of you guys here, any of you that have served in the military, uh, maybe Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, any of you guys here? Uh, such an awesome thing, you know, those that have served our country, I, I know that for us, we also have an obligation to pray for them and to hold them in high esteem. I was actually reading an article uh, recently about how these are dark days for military recruiting. The Army, Navy, and Air Force have tried almost everything in their power to bring in new people. They've relaxed enlistment standards, set up remedial schools for recruits who can't pass entry tests. They offered sign of, signing bonuses worth up to $75,000. But still in 2023, the three services together fell short by more than 25,000 recruits. And so military leaders say there are so few Americans who are willing and able to serve and many civilian employers are competing for them. And so that uh, getting enough people into uniform is nearly impossible. But uh, it's different with the Marines. The Marine Corps ended the recruiting year on September 30th, having met 100% of its goal with hundreds of contracts already signed for the next year. The Corps did it while keeping enlistment standards tight and offering next to no perks. When asked earlier this year about whether the Marines would offer extra money to attract recruits, the commandant of the Marine Corps replied, your bonus is that you get to call yourself a Marine. <laughs> that, that's your, your bonus. <laughs> so there's more here to the article, but as I was reading it, I couldn't help but think of what we're gonna be studying today in Isaiah chapter 6, in one sense, what God was doing is God was recruiting a soldier. God was recruiting a servant, but the way he did it is absolutely amazing, and it's really life-changing. You know, when you think of the fact that we're living in perhaps what are the last of the last days, uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and elsewhere that we're soldiers, right? And so the, the big question is, is am I fighting the good fight? The way that I should because Paul the Apostle right before he died those were part of his last words summarizing my life I have fought the good fight and so there's this war that we're in right we talk about this all the time because we live in fallen bodies uh, in a fallen world and we fight fallen angels and God wants to work in us and through us and that, that's why I love Isaiah 6 it's a familiar passage for us but there are things I think that can help us in this day that we live in to be those people God calls us to be. So there's four words I want to give to you. Um, and afterwards, if you can remember them, um, I'll buy you a cup of coffee afterwards. At the, uh, uh, seriously, uh, first service nobody remembered, but I know second service is better. That's what I heard anyways. Number one is the word revelation. We're going to see what God wants us to see. God wants us to see. Number two is conviction what God wants us to feel. Now, I don't like the word feel. Usually in the Christian vernacular, I kind of think about that as a, a derogatory word, but there is a, a feeling, there is a spiritual conviction, there is a cutting to the heart that we need to have. And so God wants us to see this, God wants us to feel this. Number three is the word purification, what God wants us to experience. And I know many of you here 
uh, have already experienced that cleansing, you know, from the Lord. But I think we're going to see in Isaiah, there's like a fresh cleansing. With the purification, there's going to be power. And, and then the fourth word is the word commission. Uh, uh, what God wants us to do. And I'll tell you right here, just in, from the get-go, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to get up and go. He wants us to go. The highways, the byways, the valleys, the alleys. He wants us to tell the world about Jesus. He has places for us in the body of Christ that we are to serve with. You know, the gifts that we have, you know, the worship team. So amazing to see them, you know, discovering, developing, and deploying those gifts for the glory of God. But not just the worship team, everyone here, we're going to see that. You know, and so uh, there's things that I think when I, when I read this, the Lord really spoke to my heart. And I think there's things that I think he will have for all of us as well. And so let's begin reading here in Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet, probably speaking of humility. And with two he flew. And so Isaiah was a prophet um, primarily in the northern kingdom. He prophesied for decades, you know. Um, eventually, the northern kingdom would be conquered by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And then in 586, the southern kingdom, unfortunately, would be conquered. And so he's there. Um, some have called him probably the clearest prophet regarding, you know, writing about Jesus. They even sometimes call it the Gospel of Isaiah. It's an absolute masterpiece, 66 chapters of wonder. And so this guy is definitely a special guy. And as he writes, first of all, of what he saw, what God wants us to see, this revelation, he says here when it happened, in verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died. You know, and, and it might not be all that significant. We believe it's probably right around 735 B.C. Um, and maybe he's just dating it. But I have a feeling that it is significant and something that we can glean from. You see, King Uzziah was a good ruler who ruled, check this out, for 52 years. And so, you know, when you think of a good ruler uh, ruling for 52 years, it must have been a blessing for Isaiah. And not only that... Isaiah began his ministry under the leadership of this leader, according to Isaiah chapter 1 in verse 1. And so King Uzziah, not a perfect man, a good king. Um, if you're interested, you can read his story in 2 Chronicles 26, uh, 2 Kings 15. Uh, he did falter towards the end. He made some mistakes. But generally speaking, he was a very good king. And so this vision, this revelation... It comes to Isaiah in the year that King Uzziah died. And so here's Isaiah. Maybe he's wondering what's going to happen now that he's gone. You know, my mentor has passed away. His leader is no longer there, you know, to supply that leadership. What would happen to the nation? What's going to happen to me, you know, personally, nationally? Maybe wondering, maybe worrying, right? Uzziah's son Jotham would eventually be a good king, but um, Isaiah didn't know that at the time, right? And so in the midst of what may have been a time of worry or anxiety or maybe even panic, Isaiah receives this vision from the Lord. You know, and I believe that Isaiah, like all of us, he needed to come to that realization uh, for, for the nation, and not just nationally, but personally, that ultimately God is still on the throne. Amen. We need to know that. You know, we're facing this presidential election and there's questions and I pray that you all pray for this election and you get out there and vote, right? There is that part on our part that we do diligence along these lines, but let there be no worrying or wondering 
I mean, man rules, but God overrules, amen, yeah. right? And so um, God is on the throne nationally, globally, universally, because this throne is high and lifted up. It is an elevated throne. He's the king of kings, right? The Lord of lords. But we got to know it not just nationally, but we have to know it personally in our life. Do we have that understanding? God doesn't take a day off. You know, God is still sovereign and in complete control over all of our lives. And so we need to have that understanding. Isaiah needed to see that. And, you know, you know, you might be wondering about what's going on in your land or your life. I hope that we can see this picture vividly. Do you guys ever um, have someone, or some of you that are older, you can probably relate to this, you know? Someone shows you a picture of something, hey, check this out, and you're looking at it on your phone or whatever, and you can't see it because your eyes are bad? <laughs> and, oh, there, let me get my glasses real quick, you know? Because I want to see this vividly. I want to see this accurately, right? We have to see the Lord there on that throne, high and lifted up in his glory. We need to see that, you guys. We have to make sure that we know he's ruling and reigning and he is working everything out for good. As a matter of fact, it's interesting, David Gusick points out that almost everyone in the Bible who had a vision of heaven was taken to heaven or wrote about heaven, spoke of God's throne. The prophet Micaiah saw God's throne in 1 Kings 22. Job saw God's throne in Job 26. David saw God's throne in Psalm 9 and Psalm 11. The sons of Korah saw God's throne in Psalm 45 and 47. Ethan the Ezraite saw God's throne in Psalm 89. Jeremiah wrote of God's throne in chapter 5, verse 19 of Lamentations. He says, You, O Lord, remain forever your throne, check this out, from generation to generation. Ezekiel saw God's throne in chapter 1 and 10. Daniel saw God's throne in chapter 7. And the Apostle John saw God's throne in Revelation 4. In fact, the book of Revelation may as well be called the book of God's throne because God's throne is specifically mentioned in the book of Revelation 35 times. Imagine that. And so do we have that picture? God wants us to see that vividly and powerfully, he wants us to have that revelation. You know, it could be the death of a loved one that we're struggling with. It could be the a mentor moves on. Uh, certain uncertainties about the future. Are you are you you know wondering, worrying, what's going to happen in my life, my future? You know, that's where Isaiah was, I think. And God said, I, I need to show you something. Do you see this? I am on the throne. I'm in control. I love you. You can trust me. You know, the, the train of his robe is interesting. It mentions it filled the temple. And so if you can visualize again, um, God on the throne, uh, and then the train of his robe, it just filled up the entire temple. It was just it shows the glory of God, his majesty. And then if that weren't enough, there were numerous seraphim that were there, glorious angelic beings. And this is the only time seraphim are mentioned in the Bible. And the word seraphim, it literally means like they're on fire. They're like burning ones, which is an interesting thing, you know, because we don't know much about seraphim. We know they have six wings and uh, two they cover their feet, two they cover their face and they flew. There were some uh, angelic creatures in Revelation that maybe are the same, but they're not explicitly called seraphim. But, but notice what they're doing, the Hebrew word, it says that they're glowing and they're flying. And what are they doing? They're praising God. They are praising God. Look at verse 3. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know, and you read it, holy, 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 and a lot of theologians, they want to kind of split hairs and wonder, well, what is that all about? It, it may be in reference to the Trinity, right? Because we do believe in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? You guys know that doctrine, uh, equal in essence, not in nature. I'm not in function in office. And so that's the God that we believe in. Some say maybe that's why they did it three times. 
but more than likely, uh, from a literary aspect, it's repeated for emphasis. And that's what you'll see in the Bible. Rarely you, will you see a word uh, repeated th three times. Uh, there's a few times only, but it's an always in, in reference to emphasis. And so I think it's important for us to know as we're looking at God who sits on the throne, you know, that it's not um, love that's his overriding attribute. We didn't say love, love, love. It's not grace per se that it's his overriding attribute, although we know God is love and God is so gracious, it's so amazing, right? But it's important for us as Christians to know that his overriding attribute is his holiness, that he's pure and without sin and separate from his creation. He's exalted in majesty. I think a lot of times that's what kind of messes us up is we don't realize how awesome God is, how holy God is. And these seraphim there, they're teaching us who God is and they're emphasizing his holiness. And as they're there and they're praising God, there's an earthquake going on inside of uh, God's uh, heavenly palace, which is an interesting thing. Look what it says in verse 4. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so if there was an earthquake in here, how many of you would freak out? I'm just curious. <laughs> Oh, man, it started shaking really bad, right? And so most of us here, like if there's an earthquake, they would say, well, get under the posts of the door. They would say, that's a safe place. But here it says, no, specifically, the posts of the door were shaking, you know? <laughs> and so this is uh, just, uh, it's just awesome. It is just awesome what's happening there. And I think sometimes we don't get that visual of who God is and how awesome God is. And then it says that as they're there and things are shaking and, you know, uh, it says, and then the whole place, it was filled with smoke. And so, you know, that's an interesting thing when you read that through the Bible. Um, the, the smoke, in one sense, is probably more like a cloud. Imagine what it would be like in a cloud. You know, because the cloud, it speaks of the glory of God, huh? It does. And so the Shekinah glory of God, imagine, you know, there, there was a, a, some churches, I don't know if they still do it, they had smoke machines. Did you guys ever go to those churches? They're trying to fabricate it, you know, the presence of God. And so, um, but it, it, it's not just the cloud, it's not just the softness. We're talking about smoke. We're talking about, you know, smoke comes from fire, you know. There's this aspect of just understanding who God is. It, it kind of reminds me of what we see in the book of Exodus chapter 19, in verse 18, it says, Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. I think there's a, there's a connection here because they're, as they're receiving the law from the Lord in the book of Exodus, the birth of that nation, that God did want to tell them something. He wanted to show them how holy he was. And so there's this earthquake, there's this smoke, and, and I think in one sense we see the connection here. And so Isaiah sees this. Do you see this? Have you really, do we really have an understanding? Do we have this picture hanging in, you know, our house, something that we live with every day, how awesome God is? You know, it's even interesting how he uses the word filled three times, you know? This place right here is, is filled uh, with the train of his robe, it says in verse 1. It says in, in verse 3 that the whole earth is full of his glory, and this place is filled with smoke. There's this fullness here. You know, you don't have to go to heaven to see the glory of God, although it's good to see this picture. You can just go outside and see a butterfly, and you're like, wow, that's, that's amazing to me, man. Or the hummingbirds. Isn't it a trip how they just like, they're like helicopters, man, you know? <laughs> you know, the, the music is so awesome. It's a gift from God. That's the glory of God, or the food, or the fellowship, the love, you may, you know, having a child. I mean, just those amazing things. The, the whole earth is full of his glory. And so right here, Isaiah wants us to see this, this revelation. But if you were there in that, you know, picture, 
How many of you here would, would freak out? I'm just curious. I mean, I think we're supposed to. We're, we're supposed to. Look what happens next. It says in verse 5, Isaiah says, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, not just Uzziah, but we're talking now the king, the Lord of hosts. And the Lord of hosts is in reference to the Lord of heaven's armies. And so the first word is, is revelation, what God wants us to see. The second word is conviction, what God wants us to feel. You know, when Isaiah saw this vision of the glory of God, the revelation of the Lord high and lifted up and all his awesome holiness, it was as if heaven's roof was about to fall on him and inside he was flooded, he was just filled with conviction. He said, woe is me, I'm undone. It was a declaration within his heart that he was guilty of breaking God's law and deserved the death sentence. I mean, he just, I deserve to die. You know, and it's interesting to me that that's the same thing that the Jews felt when they experienced this all awesome manifestation of God. In Exodus chapter 19, the next verse, uh, verse 19, it says, And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. And then as you see this story unfold, what you find is that the people said, You talk to God because we can't, you know, we're going to, we would die if we did. You see, the Bible, it teaches that, huh? The wages of sin is death. And so Isaiah was in tune with that. You know, C.H. Spurgeon said, God will never do anything with us till he has first undone us. You know, and at first it may sound like a good thing, you know, uh, to, to feel guilty. And it may not sound like a good thing to feel guilty and worthy of death, but it's actually a miracle, it's actually wonderful. If a person has no feeling of conviction, then it's the equivalent to spiritual leprosy. Because part of the thing that really makes me, like honestly, I haven't arrived, but I'll wake up in the morning and I'll spend time with the Lord and I just tell him, thank you for not sending me to hell. God, thank you. Because I know that I deserve that. I know I deserve hell which is just a holding tank that's like county jail right and then eventually the bible talks about this and i can't i can't not talk about it it's a place called the lake of fire and and there are some people in the world today that's what gets in their way they're like well i'm a good person i don't deserve to go there that's the problem see we have to come to this place of understanding his holiness and our wretchedness to understand i deserve to go there no, God, we can't go far without that understanding. You know, I don't know if you guys remember, but that was the people's response to Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. Now, when they heard this, it says in Acts 2.37, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer, what can I do? What shall I do to be saved? You know, and... I would say this, of course, we know that's how we get saved. But in one sense, this is interesting because we can never let go of that. We can't get over the hill, if you know what I mean. Never get over it. And what happens is, like they've been said, it's been said, the closer you get to God, the more you realize how far away you are. And you're you're feeling that conviction, but you're going to see the complete picture. And so for us, It's not just when we get saved, but it says we continue to walk with the Lord. You know, the the truth is, in looking at this, and we don't know the chronology per se, but Isaiah was probably already saved. Um, You know, and, you know, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 5 through 5, you know, he's there and he's pronouncing woes upon the people. But now God shows him himself and he's pronouncing a woe upon himself. And it's a healthy thing. You know, what happens when an individual doesn't have conviction? It's called leprosy, when you can't feel anymore. And so for us, it's actually a good thing. Remember when Jesus revealed his majesty to Peter when they were fishing? 
you know, and the Lord said, launch out in the deep. And he's like, well, we've been already fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. It's foolish. It's not the right time to do it. But nevertheless, at your word, I'll go out ahead and do it. And Peter catches this crazy amount of fish. God shows him his glory, right? God shows him a little glimpse of his glory. And what does Peter do? He says, Lord, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. You know, and I, we have to acknowledge that, you guys. I know you guys are amazing, and the girls are more amazing. I already know that, right? <laughs> But, you know, let's just embrace the fact that we are sinful men. But what God can do with sinners is amazing. We have to come to this understanding. You know, and, and something interesting about this passage right here in Isaiah, which kind of might catch us by surprise at first, you know, he says, um, Woe is me, for I am undone. Notice, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Now, to me, that's interesting, you know, because he gets specific. And so I would, I, when I talk to Isaiah, when, when we're in heaven one day, I would ask him, hey, bro, what are we talking about, like, with your lips? Were you kissing the wrong person or something or what, you know? And so, um, of course, we know it's different than that. But I'll bet you almost anything that all of us here can relate to having a lip problem, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Have you ever said something you shouldn't say, ever? You know, there's probably a lot of things that we can talk about when it comes to the lips. Uh, maybe bad language. I can't picture Isaiah cussing, but maybe he did, because we're living in a land of unclean lips, huh? I'll tell you what. So if you're here and you're dropping F-bombs, stop it, okay? I want to tell you guys that. <laughs> Uh, maybe bad language. Maybe he just, with those lips, he was complaining, all these people, they're so terrible, God. And I'm so awesome, and they're so terrible. Maybe you're a complainer. Uh, with our lips, we can easily sin. I'm reminded of Job chapter 2, verse 10. You know, he said to his wife, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And the Bible says, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. We can sin with our lips. Sometimes we talk too much. I'm guilty of that. Proverbs 10, 19, it says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. And so there's a lot of different possibilities. If you get closer to the context of Isaiah, however, it might be something different. As I mentioned earlier, you know, with those lips, Isaiah was pronouncing woes uh, to the people up to this point, chapters 1 through 5, six times. Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. But there are three fingers pointing back. And so maybe that's what he was guilty of with his lips. Again, we're not sure. Um, but there's actually more to this. I was thinking of one last thing, and that is... Um, something that Jesus quoted from the book of Isaiah, with our lips, they had sinned, because he said, these people, they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And that can happen. You know, it, here's these seraphim, these, you know, beings that are on fire for God. They're just praising God, holy, 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 they're just praising God. And maybe Isaiah was thinking of his own praise. How weak, how maybe anemic, how heartless it had become. And that can happen. You know, I'll tell you what, you guys are blessed with a, a wonderful worship team. And I know most of you here probably worship. Most of you here do. Continue to do that. But some of you who aren't, when we sing those songs with these lips, Sing those songs to God like the seraphim did. Sing those songs from your heart. Because the last thing we want in the world is for God to indict us. Say hey, you said the right things. You know, you knew the Christian knees. You had the vernacular. But your heart was so far from me. You know, for us it's important that we have this understanding. Whether it's your first time, you know, getting saved or even... A new beginning. Like for some of you here, I would venture to say, there's someone here today who needs a new beginning. Just like Isaiah, right here, Isaiah would experience a new beginning. You know, you read the ministries of individuals like John Wesley and D.L. Moody. Were they always so powerful? Were they always so effective? 
Absolutely not. They came to different crossroads in their life where God said, I want more. I want your heart. I want all your heart. And they gave it to God. And God blessed John Wesley. You read what God did through him. You read what God did through D.L. Moody. You know, uh, it says John Wesley, he tells us in his journals that while in Georgia, he learned that he who came to America to convert the Indians had never been converted himself or D.L. Moody among them, who began to preach before having clear understanding of salvation by grace and the endowment or power of the Holy Spirit. You know those seraphim who are on fire, fire for the Lord? I'll tell you what, that's symbolic of us in one sense, and I know there's more to it, but there is that aspect of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so there's Isaiah. He's as good as a dead man. The revelation, what God wanted him to see, how awesome, holy God is. Imagine being in God's presence. And then, you know, there's this aspect of conviction, how wicked and wretched we are in and of ourselves, right? And so Isaiah was as good as dead, kind of lying there on the side of the road, having been run over by God's holiness. But God wouldn't do a hit and run, huh? He will pull over and meet us there at the intersection of revelation and conviction and offer us purification. He will offer that to us. This is what God wants us to experience. Look at verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, in other words, just glowing, it's on fire, right? Which he had taken from the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. You know, the burning coal would come from the bronze altar of sacrifice. And I think you guys are probably familiar with that, but they would kill the animals. And, uh, you know, there would be different uh, sin offerings, fellowship offerings. They would cook the animals or put them in you know, boiling water, or then there would be the burn offerings and they would completely burn the animal there at the altar, right? And so as he's there, it's an interesting thing. The angel goes, and the, you know, you would figure like the angel could just pick it up with his own hands, right? But he can't, he gets some tongs, man, because they're super hot coals and he brings it. So now picture yourself, you're Isaiah, and the angel's coming towards you with his burning coals. How many of you here would run? <laughs> But, you know, he takes the burning coals and he touches the most, the lips are probably the most sensitive part of our, our exterior body there. And uh, with that, you know, he's just forgiven of all his sins because, again, that sacrifice that Jesus uh, did on Calvary to wash away all our sins, he paid the debt we couldn't pay by his blood, right? And just Isaiah at that moment, um, the weight was lifted, just forgiven completely purified and at the same time I believe with that fire empowered you know and that's what God does huh imagine that now I look at you guys and you know again the guys are, are, are worse usually than the girls but maybe not always anyways you know you guys are sinners you look at me do you see me do you know I am a sinner how many of you guys know that all right you shouldn't have raised your hand no, I'm just joking no those are people who know the Bible I, Paul the Apostle, as he ended his life, you know what he said about himself? I'm the chief of all sinners. Amen, huh? That's us, huh? Right? But I know, even though I'm not, I, even though I'm not flawless, I know I'm forgiven. Even though I'm not perfect, I know I'm pardoned. And this right here, it's just life-changing. Isaiah 118 says, Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, that's as bad as they can be, they shall be as white as snow, Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, when God looks at you, he sees no sin. No sin, because you're covered, when you're a Christian, when you're covered in the righteousness of Christ. The Bible says in Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It's, it's thrown away at the vanishing point, right? Revelation 1.5 tells us why. It says, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. 
And I was thinking about cleaning, just as a side note, you know, there's certain cleansers that work better, right? I mean, you got stains in your shower, there's certain cleansers. If you guys have a really good shower cleanser, let me know, I'm just joking. Um, I'm just joking. Um, then also, there's a stuff that gathers around the, 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 the sinks, uh, the faucets, until you see, how many of you guys use a puma stone? Is that what they're called? Yeah, pumice stone, something like that. You know, there's certain things that get certain stains out or make, you know, uh, bronze shine. The, the, the cleansing power for us is the blood of Jesus, right? And what that blood does is just so amazing. Right here, God took away his sin. It was purged by the blood. And so what happens next after the revelation, conviction, purification, now he's ready. Now he's ready. Now he will be effective. Now he will have this amazing ministry for decades to come as the prophet of God, the, you know, the, the man Isaiah. I want to say the great Isaiah because he did a great work for a great and awesome God, right? And this is how it happened with this revelation, conviction, and purification. And so we read in verse 8 what God wants us to do. It says also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. You see, after this amazing experience with God, Isaiah is ready for what comes next. You know, I don't know exactly how it went down, but I have a feeling that Isaiah overheard the conversation between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And, you know, it's almost as if, David Guzik said this, it's almost as if God was asking for help. Almost like that. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? It wasn't a direct question to Isaiah. It was just uh, an understanding of God's heart. And, you know, one of the things that we find when it comes to these things is that it won't be coerced, it won't be forced. It is something that has to be done out of the volition and free will of our heart. And so when Isaiah heard this, after seeing like this holiness, that revelation, and then understanding this deep, deep conviction, and then, you know, experiencing the purification in the Hebrew language, he said, here am I, send me. In the Hebrew language, he said, me, me, Lord, send me, send me. You ever seen kids like that? They're really eager to, you know, that's, the, the, that's where we need to be. I think a lot of times what happens in life and church is you got to drag them, you know. you got to bribe them like they did, you know, they're trying to do with these services. They're trying to force them. And God will never do that. God won't force you. God won't bribe you. God will allow you to hear the opportunity available and then we have a decision to make and whether or not you're going to respond like that i don't know man to me when i got saved what god did in my life we sang in that song we sang that song it's just like this set free no more chains when God did that in my life, what else can you do but give him your life? To serve him with a reckless abandon, completely committed, sold out, and surrendered. This is what happens when God shows you these things. Isaiah said, I'll do it, Lord. I'll do this. You know, why, why don't we go the way that we should go? He says, you know, in verse 9, go. There's that word go. In verse 8, who will go? You know, why don't we go? You know, why don't we tell people about Jesus? You know, why don't we share the word with people at Office Depot or Target? You know, why don't we call up our friends or family members and invite them to church service? A lot of, some of you do, but maybe there are many of you who don't. You know, God's calling you to start a ministry. God's calling you to get involved in ministry. And maybe there's a couple, someone that might be listening is going to be a pastor one day. And Justin answered the call. He was asked and, you know, he, God showed him. 
you know, this is how it works. It's not an easy thing being a pastor by any means. But maybe there'll be someone that God's going to send out over to that city, you know, over yonder, far away. You know, God will call you, and I'm telling you this, just know it, man, the sincere heart, calling of God, teach the Bible, love the people. God will bring the people. God will bless the church. You know, for us, we have to have this heart, you know, to, to say not yes and not no when God says go. My dad, when he got saved, eventually his ministry was just giving out tracts. And that's a really easy ministry, you guys. You know, have some tracks, have some invites, or you just tell people about the church. It's really cool. You just never know, hey, how you doing? I just want to invite you to this event we're having. And then, you know, you can kind of feel them out at that point. If they're like, you know, like stiff arming you, that's, we're going to talk about that. That's okay. You just see what the Lord does with that track. Or if sometimes it's just a divine appointment, they're just about to kill themselves. And God brought you to them to point them to Jesus and I've seen it happen over the years I always love going street witnessing and it's a beautiful thing I, I don't know what the go will be I don't know the divine details of the go in your life but I pray that we would all be in tune with the Lord you know I you know for the most part the people would not listen look at verse 9 and he said go and and tell this people keep on hearing but do not understand and Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their e eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. And God's saying, you got, you got to go, and they're not going to listen to you. And, you know, you're going to go and you're going to share and... The more you share, the more they won't see, the more they won't hear, the harder their hearts will get. I mean, how many of us want a ministry like that? We're like, Lord, I don't know about that. But the, you see, the results are not our responsibility. And sometimes it's the reason we don't go, or reason we don't share with someone that God wants us to share with, because we know where they're going to shoot us down. Do it anyways, because God has called us to. Now, generally speaking, as I said earlier, this nation would reject God, but there's always a remnant, right? There's always some, right? And as a matter of fact, when you look at this, I don't want you guys to think that God was closing their eyes and closing their ears, and God himself was the one that was hardening their hearts. No, because when Jesus quoted this in Matthew 13, 13 through 14, when Jesus quoted it, he said, they've closed their eyes. And that's why God would solidify them in their decision. And so there would be a remnant. And notice what it says there at the end of verse 10. And, they, and, and if they did return, what God is saying here, they would be healed. And maybe there's someone out there who needs to return today. And God promises, I, I will heal you, right? And so don't worry about the fact that you're not reaping in the harvest. Our job is just to scatter the seed. And so in verse 11, Isaiah uh, says, And I said, Lord, how long should I do this? And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate, the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of of the land. God just said, you have to keep doing it, and eventually what's going to happen after you, Isaiah, there's going to be Jeremiah, and then the people are going to be conquered, they're going to be taken away to Babylon. You just have to keep doing it for the rest of your life. But in verse 13, he says, but yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming. That, that tenth would actually come back. There would be a remnant that would come back from Babylon. They would actually experience a, a tough time too. They would actually re experience devastation as well. But at the end, he says right here, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. And so have you guys ever noticed that when you cut stuff down, I mean, it doesn't matter how, I mean, pretty much, you know, you cut it, it always grows back. Have you guys noticed that? <laughs> You know, I just got done cutting all this stuff on the side of my house, and I know it's going to be coming back. I've got this English ivy that just takes over. And, uh, you know, God is just saying, this is what's going to happen to Israel. They're eventually going to come to a place where it's just like a stump 
that's left. But out of that stump, Isaiah 11, 1, Jesus will shoot forth and Israel would continue to go forward. And today we see them in the land. Imagine that after thousands of years of being displaced. And now Israel is in the land, just like Ezekiel 36 and 37 says. And, and God says, even though there's going to be a stop there, there's this holy seed that I have, and there's a work for them to do. And so for us, um, my, my prayer is, again, the results are in his hands. It's not our job uh, to be you know, effective or successful in, in the world's eyes. Our responsibility, you guys know what it is? Second Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 says, be faithful. Faithful. And that's all. And so, have you seen his holiness? Do you guys know how awesome he is? Have you seen this conviction? Do you, have you felt that? Yeah, I pray that we would in a healthy way. Have you experienced his purification? You know, the forgiveness? Think about it, all gone, and the power, you're living in that, like the seraphim, on fire. And then for us, now there's a great commission. One day, every single one of us will stand before God and give an account. Did you do what I asked you to do? Or did we bury our talents? I pray that, you know, we would, like the Marines, you guys know what their motto is? Semper Fi. Semper Fi. And that is talking about us always faithful. Amen? Because he's faithful and he's worthy. So let's go fight. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for your word. I pray that you bless these beautiful people, Lord. I ask that you would just work in us as a church, Lord. And maybe there's today's like a calling for a new beginning. God, I want more of you. I want the fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit. I need power. I need you to take those tongs from the altar, Lord, and touch my lips and touch my heart. I want that, Lord. And I pray that for your people. And I pray if there's anyone here today who maybe doesn't know you, they're not a Christian, they've just been playing church, or maybe they were invited by someone, Lord, I pray that today they would know your love, that you died, Jesus died on the cross for us, rose again, and the Bible says that as many as received him, to them he, became, he gave the right to become children of God. Your word, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So Lord, touch hearts today. I pray for anyone here that needs that, that first beginning, that they would come forward for prayer today. We love you, Lord. I lift this church to you, this beautiful church. Uh, Justin, Anissa, Lord, I pray for all the leadership, pastors, all the servants, and that you would raise up more, Lord, because your word says uh, uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So we pray, Lord, that you would send laborers out into your harvest. We love you and thank you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I brought some oil. Um, nothing special about it. It's just from Israel. No, I'm just joking. It's just, it's just um, If any of you here needs prayer, uh, we just come forward afterwards. We would love to pray with you. Maybe you just need a new beginning. Uh, maybe um, you want a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, that you know, purification, that power. Um, yeah, if that's you, uh, just feel free to come forward after we sing this last song. God bless you guys.